what we have right now is the amp warming up. I tightened down a couple things. We have a, a, an 8 ohm speaker connected, my temporary. Uh, this is just to ensure that obviously, you know, I, I don't like to leave the uh, finals uh, disconnected. And we're just going to be taking measurements right here at the power supply. That's all we're doing. We know that these resistors are wrong, but I want to have some before voltages. Uh, we set this up the two parts. Basically, we're measuring voltage from here, and then we're measuring voltage from the whole rest of the amplifier. That's, that's the two parts. So we're doing this first. So I got my kilowatt running into my isolation transformer. It's 117. That's why I like this. It puts out 117 volts just like these old uh, amplifiers do. And I read the voltages across here with the uh, resistors being good, bad, or indifferent. And what I got was 423, 314, and 260. Um, it expects uh, 415. It's seeing 423. Give it a little bit of wiggle room and say that's uh, okay. Uh, 314 for uh, C seems to be uh, just about on the money. It's really hard for me to trace out and make these videos. I'm probably staring right at it with the camera right here. Uh, it's a little bit low, but then consider that that particular resistor is also out of tolerance too. That resistor uh, really has way too much of a drop in it. You know, so if we, the resistor was corrected, that voltage would bump up because it's 14K when it should be 10. So we'll go with that. This 2, 260 here can't be substantiated from the underside because the derail, as we see here, makes its way up here and immediately comes to another voltage drop resistor to 170. We can only collaborate this story from the other side as we can hit it from under here and see what happens after that to see what, what the product is. So there's our readings. We have to shut down the amp now. We have to discharge these capacitors. We have to safely uh, remove that, uh, go through all the safety procedures, and only then can we flip it over and turn it back on and continue. Uh, we could take a look, uh, we could do our center tap reading here if we would like uh, to see this 420 before it goes through uh, TR2 right here. A couple things we could do here, so we'll take a look. This has been a power off testing event for the amplifier. Everything discharged, nothing's on on the bench. And what I started doing was uh, first from yesterday, well, it started as a power on testing event. And yesterday I started looking at voltages, keeping in mind that those two resistors up top were so far off that they're going to pull down um, B, C, and D substantially because of the fact that they're off. And I knew that they were off, but there were still anomalies. And a lot of the anomalies that I was seeing, keeping in mind that they were off, had to do with a lot of the circuits that depend upon um, cathode bias tubes like the 12AT7, 12AX7. These 7025s that you see here, don't, don't be confused. They're 12AX7s. Um, back in the day, it was in vogue to have military-grade 12AX7s in, in this amplifier, and, and that's all they are. Um, but it does make it a lot easier to look at these diagrams and see 7025s as opposed to a handful of 12AX7s in this. So I'm happy to have it, right? So I, I looked at this, and I even looked at the bias that wasn't far off. We see a, a 34 dot two, not too bad. A couple things eluded me. However, as I look at the um, <clears throat> the uh, voltages on the uh, respective 6v6s, I saw 415 on one and 411 on the other. With a, uh, a center voltage of 416, I didn't know how that was possible. I took some resistance meetings, readings right here, and I saw that, that they're pretty much on point, that there is a little more resistance in one than the other, but it's, it's somewhat trivial. So just very strange. But I took a look around I, and I looked at the sum of the tubes and I want to go through some of the things that I found. One of the things that, that, that alarmed me aside from the obvious that I pointed out here with these voltages was, was some of the, the readings I was getting on, on these cathode bias circuits. And, and when I looked at it and some of the readings looked nice and some of them really looked off the wall. Uh, you know, people go and they, they pop out all these capacitors and they throw the capacitors in and they, they think hum went away and everything's fine. And and the only bias that people look at, they, they look at the finals and they say, yeah, you know, that's good because it's it's actually solid state rectification. And they, they, they immediately they look at that number. And as long as that number matches up, they don't even really care about the, the current going through the tube and it's irrelevant. But there are other tubes here and these tubes are equally important because if these tubes sound like crap or they're set up like crap, then these are going to be set up like crap. So... 
when I, when I started looking through and saw some of these these values that were coming through here, and I see some some of these are set a bit low and some of these are, are set a bit high, then you know the bias is going to be wrong, and they're all pretty much based on the potential, you know, of of the entire chassis, you know, the whole thing set up cumulatively. So the only thing that could be wrong is resistors. And as I started going through this, I said this is becoming uh, a waste of time to go through and look at these voltages. I should actually start working this backwards and look at resistors. So what I did was I actually shut down this chassis and I, and I literally went through because it's such a pleasure working on a board like this. I mean, this isn't even a hardship because you're really working from right to left, you know. And I, I, I went through the board and if the resistor didn't look crazy, you know, then, then I said, okay, fine, it'll be blue. If it was untestable, I put UNT if it can't be tested in circuit because it presents a, a path that has a lower resistance than that resistor itself, whatever, you know. But the first ones I tested, you know, we look right here, and it's this this cathode bias circuit right here where, where this uh, uh, resistor, these capacitors were replaced as part of cathode bias circuit, and we see that these 1500s is 2060, and this other one here is like, 1900 which would explain why this cathode bias voltage has changed and the the uh, um the the uh, uh, voltage has increased and therefore the current of that tube is actually much lower than it should be which completely changed the sound of the amplifier on that circuit and if we see what they feed right down here this is our 7025s and these are the inputs for both the vibrato and the normal of the amp so right off the bat right at the very beginning of the input of this amplifier we've already ruined the sound from what it originally should be just with these two resistors because everybody runs in and they go and they, they oh these are the old capacitors and rip them out you know and nobody looked at the resistors right so i went through and and this is what i found and you could see in red but I want to point out that there's also some things here where I wrote 3.3 .3 in unit where it says 4.7 or 10, 100K in unit where it says a, a different value. And what I found was is that this sheet, and I have to go and look through those. There's only a couple of them. There's like three or four. I did take the readings, but this sheet doesn't entirely match the schematic. I shall cite an example. If you look at the, the this particular tube right here, it, it shows 100K and 100K. Uh, for this 12 AT7 and if I and, and what I found was a hundred K and an 80 82 K and I annotated that right here that it was found but when I look at the schematic diagram from the same publication you'll see that it was in fact a hundred K and an 82 K so the schematic is right and the sheet is wrong but I didn't know it at the time and then once I I, I made that uh, um, discovery then I said okay I'll just go back on those couple and, and recheck that again so that's what I'll do so I know that the schematic is good but I know which, now I've identified, identified which resistor need to be changed in order to bring this back into specification, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm looking down in the 6v6 tube socket, the one that doesn't seat properly, and if you look down through all these holes, you know, you can see they're all, all clear except for that one in question, and you can see that it's obstructed. It's probably lead. It's probably that somebody was uh, a bit overzealous. I'm not sure. I'm going to stick a pin down there and see if the metal's soft. If it is, it's lead. And I'm going to see if I could actually work that back out and then retension the pins. If I can, I could salvage this socket because I can't seem to find this socket readily. Even sites that offer up this fender socket, I don't, I don't know. It comes in white. I, I don't know what they were thinking. So clearly, when they say that that this reverb blackface amplifier, you know, it's a direct drop in. It's clearly not a direct drop in, but I'm, I digress. So. I'll, I'll first of all I'll find out if it's lead and if it is lead you know I'll see if I could I could just flow it back you know out of the socket or push it out of the socket and see what we could do here depending on how it formed and and I may be able to salvage this but I'm still going to remove all these crappy resistors and replace them but but at least the socket will be salvaged I tried to find the best way to fix the 6v6 tube socket that I could ended up using an old 6v6 I heated up that pin on the bottom and when it was heated up I took that old 6v6 I put it in the socket, pushed it down in position, set it just right, checked the clearance, and when it was good, I let it cool down, pulled it back out, and then checked the pins, make sure the pins were aligned, and then when that was good, I put in the original 6v6, and now everything is perfect. Everything lines up, the tube now seats perfectly. So the 6v6 problem is solved. Now we're going to tighten this bad boy down. 
We're going to check the capacitors on the bottom and we should be all ready waiting for the resistors to arrive to finish up this amplifier and test it out. So I was absolutely amazed. I went through and checked all of these capacitors, all the blue ones you see here, all these original capacitors, and I checked it to the highest standards, not to this weird guitar audiophile. They got to be original, so they have this weird sound sort of thing. Um, they were checked for capacitance, ESR, and obviously uh, torture tested on the IT11. Each and every one of them passed perfectly, and uh, they were annotated, and they're going to go back in, or they are back in. Um, they're good. They're good like the day they were new. All of them measured a little bit low, uh, but within tolerance, but uh, amazing. So those capacitors are good. They're not going to be replaced. They're original. They stay in, and that's the end of story as far as those capacitors are. So like I said, uh, as soon as the resistors arrive, uh, this last capacitor will be replaced. It's been verified as an upgrade to go 100-100 on that one. Resistor work will be done. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to just fire up the sample fire since I did uh, unseat these ca uh, capacitors, make sure everything's still cool, that nothing happened, and we're ready to proceed. Uncle Doug's video talks about a uh, ticking sound that is demonstrated when turning on the reverb. I'm seeing the or experiencing the same thing on this as well as uh, seeing the ticking sound is synchronized with the pulse from the, the uh, um, optic coupler here. Very interesting to use an optic coupler. Uh, we're going to demonstrate that. What we're going to do is, is we're going to uh, turn on the reverb right here. We're going to come over to the optic coupler. We're going to view it and then we're going to listen to it in the speaker by putting the phone up against it and hopefully I can capture that. So here is uh, the optic coupler here. It has the, the yellow. I want to stick my fingers in. It is operational, right? Let me turn it on. And the ticking has started. Let's see if we get a better view from the other side. I don't I don't have the light on so you can see the camera better. So doing the best I can here. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. And now I'm gonna the reverb is on, and now I'm gonna turn up the uh speed. And it takes a while for the when you turn the, the handle, it takes a while for the uh the speed to catch up. So it's on one. And I'm gonna flip it up to ten. And now you can see it's on ten. Get a little closer there. All right, now I'm going to flip back to one, and then you'll see how long it takes to catch up. Ready? One. Well, actually, one went pretty quick. So now I'm going to flip it to ten. And now we're at ten. So now if I bring it over back to one, so we, so we get nice and slow, the intensity on high. Attempt to bring the... Uh, um. You can see here the ticking. It's kind of hard to hear. Let me, let me try and put a, a, another segment together so we can hear the ticking. Here's uh, another attempt at realigning the camera for the ticking. The reverb that we're using here, the reverb tank, is, is not from this amplifier. Uh, Chris and I found a couple from uh, some PA systems that we ripped out and saved. Uh, so using this for testing and to play around with, uh, also to satisfy the reverb circuit here for testing, I just plugged it in uh, so we could check out some of the things on this amplifier before we do uh, the resistor repair. So uh, interesting note that, you know, this is actually quite stable. So if I, if I give a strum on the guitar here, you know, and we come to the reverb and we go and we, we, we shake the pan a little, we don't hear any audible change. But if we, if we do shake the springs themselves, we get some pretty cool thunder that we'll listen to here right now. Just come up to the speaker. I, I just thought that was kind of cool. But, um, you know, we could exacerbate that, obviously, by uh, going and, you know, adding some intensity. But, yeah, 
uh, wanted to go and, and make those final checks because obviously I did remove all of these capacitors from circuit and now wanted to make sure that everything was okay since I put those capacitors in before I did any further work.